that I have just published. Uh, it's called uh, A World of Three Zeros. Zero poverty, zero unemployment, and zero net carbon emission. This is basically a kind of a, a journey of all the experiences that I have gone through in my work, <clears throat> which started with uh, lending tiny money to poor people in Bangladesh and grew into many other directions. So I'll try to give you a kind of overview of what this is all about, why we think these goals are important in the context of uh, the present world situation. To give you an idea where it all began, I was teaching in one of the universities in Bangladesh, teaching economics, back in the 70s. And this was a period when we are going to extreme economic situation. There's a lot of poverty, a lot of hunger. And we even ended up with famine in the country. So when you teach economics and see the outside world beyond your classroom, going through all this, it raises a lot of questions in your mind. What good is economics if it cannot address all this? So what am I teaching? All those elegant theories of economics that I so proudly explain to my students. Gradually I get the sense that these are all empty words. This has no meaning, sounds good, but not relates to the life of the people. So the question comes, why am I teaching them? So I was going through this kind of agony that, uh, what do I do? So one idea that I came up to kind of uh, salvage myself, if this, what I teach doesn't work, I have to find out if I can be some use to somebody in some other way, if I cannot go this way. So one way I thought I can do that, why don't I go to the village next door to the university campus and see I can be of some help to somebody as a person, not trained economist or something, just as a human being, people in distress, people in serious trouble, if there's something that I can do for, even for one individual. So that was the beginning, back in 1976. And I keep doing it every day, see I can, how I can be some use to people. Then I learned a lot of things about the village. When you go to the village, say, same village over and over again, you get to know them very well. So I became part of it. And one thing, led me to one particular direction. That was the loan sharking in the village. People give tiny loans to the neighbors, and in the name of the loan, in the name of the loan, they grab all the things the other person possesses. And the more you see it, you see it in very close range. You see the victims of loan sharking and the person who practices the loan sharking. They are all neighbors, they are not two different kinds of planet. And you feel extremely ugly about the whole thing, how a human being can be so cruel to each other. And again, you feel helpless because you don't know what to do in a situation like that. How do you protect people? Here I am trying to say that I can see if I can make myself useful but I cannot make myself useful in a situation like this. And my economics teaching, whatever I have learned in classrooms, never gave me any idea, never in a form of a paragraph or a sentence, what you do in a situation of load sharking. It doesn't belong to that traditional economic theories that we learn. 
So I had to come up with an idea what to do. The one idea that I came up with, why don't I lend the money myself? The idea is a very simple one. If I lend the money, few people will come to me to borrow the money. They don't have to go to loan shark anymore. So those people are protected from the victimization of the loan shark. Because I offered them a very simple version. I said, you give me, I give you the money, you pay me back. No other conditionality is nothing. So if compared to the other part, other option, this is very attractive. So as I started doing it, some people started borrowing from me. I gave the money from my own pocket. This is very small money. Two dollars, five dollars, ten dollars. That's about the size of the loan. And it became very popular. So as it grew, I became very happy because I saw that people are responding to what I was doing. They must be very happy because they don't have to go to Russia. And it became so big in a couple of years that I thought in order to sustain it, continue it, maybe I should create a bank because it's working. Everything works perfectly and I'm very happy with that. Why don't I create a bank so that I can continue with it? That's when I came to big serious conflict with the banking system. Banking system says, no, it cannot be done. And I went to the central bank, I went to the finance ministry to get their permission to set up a bank. Everybody said it cannot be done. So I kept on repeating the need for it and the examples that we have in the village, several villages in the neighborhood. And ultimately, 1983, we got the permission we became a bank, called it Grameen Bank or Village Bank, and continued to do the same thing that I was doing before. Now more aggressively because I have the bank with me. I created a bank, so money is not a problem. All I have to do is to take the deposit from the other people and lend the money to the poor people. And it became very popular internally and outside people became very curious how it is done. Everybody asked me the question, how did you design the bank? What, what is the intricate thing that you do in your banking that it works? The designing part of it, how it was done. You must have done lots of research to do that. I said, no, I don't do any research. I just go on doing things which I think would work out for people. That don't seem to be making them very happy with my answer. So I tried to explain in another way. I said, look, I don't know anything about banking. That was my advantage. Since I don't know anything about banking, I could do anything I want. Nothing is telling me behind my brain that, no, no, you can't do this. This is against this principle, against that. So I was free. So I used my freedom my mental field. Every time I see a, an issue that I have to address, I need a new principle, new policy. I look at the conventional banks, how they do it. Once I learn how they do it, I just do the opposite. And it worked. And if you look at the whole Grameen Bank, it's nothing but piece by piece, the opposite of what the conventional banks do. Conventional banks go to the rich. The richer you are, more attractive you are for them. We reverse it. We go to the poor. Poorer you are, more attractive you are. You are the, if you are the poorest, you are the most attractive for the bank, our bank. Conventional bank asked for collateral. This is a big issue, and the fundamental issue in banking. You must have enough 
to borrow some from the bank. Since the poor people don't have anything, the question of collateral doesn't exist, doesn't make any sense. So we dismissed it. Conventional banks want collateral, we said no collateral. So the entire banking system has to be run on the basis of trust. So we created a whole system which works on trust. And it works very well. That's how it became known, is repayment is one. Better than the conventional banks, you lend money to the poor people, you do that. In Bangladesh context, conventional banks focus on men. We focused on women. They again, reversed it. So today in Bangladesh, Gamin Bank has over 9 million borrowers. Mostly women, 97% of them are women. Rural women all over Bangladesh. We work in every single village of Bangladesh, which has over 80,000 villages. So that's where we work. So again, we reverse the conventional bank in that sense. Another basic principle that we adopted right from the beginning when we were tiny one. People should not go to the bank. Banks should go to the people. So our entire system is based on reaching out to people. They don't have to come to our office. To illustrate that, today we have over 9 million borrowers, as I said, in 80,000 villages. So our staff have to go to all those 80,000 villages, meet all those 9 million borrowers at their doorstep within one week. Because everything in our bank is a sec weekly cycle. You make payments in weekly cycles, you get new loans in weekly cycles, whatever is done in, in, through that weekly visit. It's rain, shine, flood, doesn't matter you meet all those nine million borrowers at their doorsteps. So that's again is a very different from the conventional banks. Conventional banks are owned by rich people. If you own a bank, you must be a rich person. And particularly it's a rich man who owns a bank. We reverse that too. Grameen Bank is owned by poor people because all the borrowers are the owners of the bank. So it's a bank owned by poor people and poor women because our borrowers are women. So again, that's the reverse also. So you go piece by piece, you have a whole series of things which is done in a reverse way. But it puzzles everybody, how does it work? Because conventionally we think that if you give money to poor people, they will eat up the money, they will never pay, pay back the money and so on. But here it works. So it drew a lot of curiosity from the rest of the world. First, they dismissed this as a hoax, some kind of a gimmick. We invite them to come and visit. They said, look, it's a very open thing. Why don't you find out what is the trick is? After they spend some time with us, they become totally convinced and they want to do it themselves in their own countries. So the idea has spread all over the world. It became known as microcredit or tiny loans. Every time I come to the US, invited by events to speak on Grameen Bank, people will always ask questions, oh, it will not be workable in the United States because it's a very different country than Bangladesh. I said, no, it should be working everywhere. But simple question is, do you have people who are not reached by the conventional financial system? If there are, then you need a coming bank because coming bank is to fill up that gap. To my knowledge, half the population of the entire world are outside the scope of the banking system. That's where the problem is. And I try to explain that Financial services is like the economic oxygen for people. If you don't have oxygen, you cannot breathe, you cannot function, you collapse. 
Same thing happens when you do not have economic oxygen. You cannot function, you cannot breathe. Economically, you cannot remain active, you become dysfunctional. I said, because that financial oxygen is not available for the half of the population of the world, that's why they remain poor, because they can't get, that's what we call, when you say dysfunctional, that's when we call them poor. The moment you connect them with the financial oxygen, they become alive, they become active, they become creative. There's nothing wrong with them. Simply that pipeline is missing. So I said, if you have this type of people in the United States, of course they need the same financial oxygen like everybody else. Then there's some says, well, we have tried it many ways in the United States. Some says we've tried it a hundred times in a hundred different ways. Some say 200 times, 200 different ways. I said you can do thousand times in thousand different ways. If, you still does, if it still doesn't work, I said, it's not the fault of the people, it's the fault of the people who are doing it. You have not done it the right way. So I was challenged to do it myself. I said, why don't you come and show that it can be done in the United States? So I took that challenge. I said, okay, I'll do that. In 2008, January, we began our first branch in New York City, in Jacksonite, Queens. And it, it became a beautiful branch, 100% replica of Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. It works as beautifully as it does in Bangladesh, we have no problem. Then people say, well, we need more branches here, we want branches in another borough of New York City. So during the last 10 years, we started in 2008, by 2018, we now have seven branches in New York City. And in total, within the United States, we have 20 branches in 12 cities, including Los Angeles. Yeah. There are two branches in Los Angeles. And the third branch will be opened on 14th, today's 10th on 14th. I'll be back on 14th in Los Angeles, launch this branch in Los Angeles. In total, there are 20 branches. If we have this new branch, there will be 21 branches in 12 cities. In Omaha, Nebraska, Charlotte, North Carolina, in Boston, in Houston, in Miami, and so on. We have over 100,000 borrowers by now, all women, 100% women, And we have given, in the 10 years of time, we have given over a billion dollars in loan with near perfect repayment record, near 100% repayment record in every single branch. And every single branch is sustainable, meaning that it covers all its cost. So it's not a charity program in any sense. All the costs are borne by the system that we have. Our startup loan, is about $1,500. You'll be amazed how desperate people are in all these cities to get that $1,500 to make a start in their life. And when, before we began, people say, oh, what can they do with people here? In, in Bangladesh, you can buy a cow, you can sell the milk, or buy some chicken, and lay the eggs, sell the eggs, or grow some vegetables. That's why it works. Here, it doesn't work. I said, no. That's not how it works. People know what they want to do. You can't figure it out yourself. I said, I don't know what they will do. Simply I'll raise the question, is there something they can, you can do if you had the money? This of course we have. So now we have enormous experience in the USA, how people start. People start with the hairdressing, very simple thing, buys, a chair in a hairdressing place and supplies, and you are in a hairdressing. Suddenly, you are a professional hairdresser. Or you used to be made in some homes, cook them, cook for them, so you know all the cooking. Simply, you don't have a job. So you get the money, you back in the cooking. You make the good pastry, you make the good bread, you make good things, you make beautiful cakes, you sell them. You pass on your business card if you. 
need to buy, you need to make cakes for your celebrations and so on, give it to me, I'll give you the best cake possible. And they get good response. One used to work in a house cleaning service. She lost her job because she was sick. She got well, but she doesn't have a job. So she joined Grameen Bank. She said, I know, I know what to do. All I need is a little machine so that I can do the cleaning without it, instead of my hands. So she got into home cleaning business with a business card selling, telling them I can do better than the service that they provide because I used to work for them. And it will be half the price because I come by myself. Now many of them are hiring extra people because the business is flood, expanding for them. Taking care of pets, another very attractive business, dogs and the cats and so on, such a flourishing business. I said in Bangladesh, we'll never think of such a business of dog walking. But this is a walk, it's a business here. So everybody finds out how to do that kind of thing. So that idea of microcredit kind of as it expanded in the United States, we have, as I said, in the first 10 years, we have given over, over a billion dollars. Now we are planning to do it the next decade, next 10 years, to increase the number of branches from 20 to 40. That's a very modest kind of idea. By the time we do that, we'll have 250,000 borrowers. And to them, according to our projections, we'll be lending $11 billion in the next decade. So what a change for the first decade, first 10 years, it took 10 years to build up first billion dollar loan. In the next decade, you're actually lending a billion per year in a very modest expansion. You could expand it to 100 branches, 1,000 branches, it doesn't matter because each branch is independent. So it's not that you collapse. That's how we did it in Bangladesh. Each is a profit center, you make it happen. And each one is, uh, follows the same procedure and makes it uh, self-sustaining. So I got into this debate on the financial system itself. And that led me to many other issues which I'll quickly share with you. But as I was doing this microcredit in Bangladesh, as I come closer and closer to the poor people, I see many problems with the poor people. Besides the loan part of it. Healthcare is an issue. If you are poor, you are poor in health. It goes together. Your children are poor in health, skinny, malnourished children. So our attention is focused on healthcare. So we created a huge, huge healthcare program as a health insurance program. And it works beautifully, self-sustaining. We provide all the health care to the poor people independently. We have doctors, we have nurses, clinics, all coming from the premium that we get from the insurance program. The same idea, we started using it in New York City because America has the same health care problem. With the, before the Obamacare, there were 47 million people outside the healthcare system. After Obamacare, it came down to 18 million people outside the healthcare system. The people that we work with are among those 18 million people because the, they are the lowest people in the country. So we created our own healthcare system in New York City in one branch to try it out whether we can make it a self-sustaining and make it happen, independent healthcare system for themselves run by their own money. And it's doing very well for the last three years now we were working there. So what works in Bangladesh, we bring it to the United States, microcardio, healthcare system and so on. And then it went to do many other issues. Like Bangladesh doesn't have electricity in the villages. 85% of the people live in villages of Bangladesh, but no electricity. 22 years ago, we decided why don't we bring electricity to the villages of Bangladesh on our own. Try it at least. 
So we created a company to bring solar energy in the villages of Bangladesh. Everybody said it's never going to work in Bangladesh. Solar energy is a very frontier technology. You cannot bring it to Bangladesh. It's, it's good for North America or Europe or something. I said, no, this technology you can be used anywhere. It doesn't matter where you are. So we created that and started selling solar home system. Explaining to people how good it is, how better it is for the turning from the fossil fuel kerosene to green energy, etc. But didn't get much response. People found it very expensive and so on. So we came up with, we didn't want to go, give up because we thought we didn't know how to sell it. Idea is good, but the marketing is not right. So we came up with the idea and just used it. What we do, we go to the village and when we go to the village, we tell the, ask the people how much you spend on kerosene. After all, you have your kerosene lamps. You must be spending some money on kerosene. How much do you spend each month in kerosene? Everybody knows that. The deal we gave them, you give me the kerosene money every month. You don't buy kerosene. Give the money to us, we give you electricity. Every month you do that for the next three years. After you have done it for three years, you don't have to pay a penny to anybody. You don't have to buy kerosene, it's all free now. In other words, our money will be paid back in three years. People love that idea. 22 years later, we have now four million homes in Bangladesh with solar energy. So we created hospitals, we created many other businesses. We have created more than 50 businesses in Bangladesh to solve problems. Every time I see a problem, I create a business to solve it. That way I saw the problem of electricity, I create a business to solve it. I saw the problem of healthcare, I create a business to solve it. But these businesses are different than the conventional business we are all familiar with. That's what created a big debate with me. Is it a really business? Maybe it's, you call it a charity. I said, why should I call it charity? It's a business. But it doesn't have the essentials of a business. I said, what is the essential of business? So you have to maximize profit. I said, is this what the business is all about? But to me, business is to be self-sustaining. It runs by itself. You don't have to bring things from outside. It, you create an organism which functions by itself. And this is what it does. No, this is not what people can do. I said, why not? You don't take any profit out of business. I said, yes, it's my decision. If I don't take profit out of my own business, is there a law in Bangladesh that I'll be put in jail for that? I said, I don't see such a law. So I, I don't want to make money. I want to solve problems. So my full concentration in solving problems, not making money. I said, I remove the whole profit motive from my business. My motive is to solve the problem. That's another motive. So no, 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 no. If you take away the profit motive, Profit motive is the incentive in the entire world for business. So you are taking away the profit motive, business cannot function. I said, I agree partially with you, not fully with you. Profit motive is a strong motive, incentive in business, but not the total incentive. It's, a hundred, it's not the only incentive in the world. There are many other incentives in the world. Then they ask me, what is the other incentive? I said, well, to me, probably I'll put it this way. I said, making money is a happiness. That's why it's an incentive. Making other people happy is a super happiness. That's an incentive too. So I like this incentive. It's a super incentive for me. I like it. Then I got into this debate. I said, you know what? The whole economic system is based in a wrong premise. That's why we are suffering from all these confusions. In the whole economic system, of capitalist system, human being is misinterpreted. It is interpreted as someone who is driven by self-interest. 
So only thing economic system recognizes is self-interest or selfishness. I said, but real human being is much bigger than that. Real human being has both selfishness and selflessness. So that's why we went wrong. As a result, we became, the whole world became driven by self-interest because that's the only thing which is recognized by the theory and we follow the theory. So theory has put glasses on us with dollar signs. We see the world with dollar signs. We cannot see anything else. I said, if we come to close or a real interpretation of a human being, I can say it's a combination of selfishness and selflessness. But the system says, no, if you want to be selfless, you go into charity, you become a philanthropist. I said, no, why should I go into philanthropy? I can stay in business and be selfless. I can create selfless business. So distinction between the two, the way I explained. I said, in selfish business, everything is for me, nothing for others. In selfish, selfless business, everything for others, nothing for me. So it's a choice. It's nobody forcing you to do it. I like it, so I do it. If you don't like it, you don't have to do it. But the economic system doesn't allow you the choice. That's where we went wrong. As a result, we created an economy which is now in a disaster path. The way we are proceeding, we are heading for a big disaster. It's a kind of time bomb right now. Because the system is, is a kind of a mechanism of wealth concentration. All the wealth gets concentrated fewer and fewer hands. 100 years back, 50 years back, we didn't notice it because the speed was so slow. Now we notice it because speed is so fast. Everything is going in one direction. Four years back, there are 265 people in the world who own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the population at that time. Today, only eight people in the world who owns more than 50% population, what is owned by 50% bottom population. When we know them, all these eight people who own, in totality, own more wealth than the bottom 50%. What will happen next year? Next, next year could be worse. Two people, three people will be owning more wealth than the bottom 50% because the concentration of wealth is becoming faster and faster and faster. So we have huge mushroom of wealth for few people. And then the stem of the mushroom is becoming thinner and thinner, which is the wealth for the rest of the world. That is not a sustainable world. So un unless we re rethink about the whole idea, we will be up for disaster very soon. And that's a path we are taking. So I try to remind them that we need to do that. How does social business work in it? The business that non the, the profit, the selfless businesses? If you are in a selfless business, then we don't have any dividend for us ourselves. It's a non-dividend company to solve human problems. So that's a, if you create more and more of those, more attractive, more contribution it does to slow down the wealth concentration because you're not taking dividend out of it. While we are doing the social business in Bangladesh, many people from outside the world, Bangladesh became interested in it. One is a big company, Danone, in France. They became very interested in our concept. They say, we want to create a social business. After long discussions, finally we created a joint venture, social business with Danone, to solve the problem of malnutrition in the country. Children are malnourished. So we produce a special kind of yogurt, put all the micronutrients in the yogurt, vitamin, iron, zinc, iodine, and all that, in the right proportion. So that if a child eats this yogurt, get the micronutrients back and becomes healthy child and make it very cheap because when you are in a social business, cost of production will go down because you don't need any fancy frills, attractive gimmicks here and gimmick there. You come to the basics. So you make it very cheap. And people enjoy it. Children are eating it. It's popular yogurt for children. And children are coming out of malnutrition. 
Then other companies became very interested. Uniqlo from Japan, they want to do social business with us, so we had a joint venture there. there. Now we have joint ventures with many companies because every company wants to create a social business. This is what I tell you. You continue with your company, what you do, but on the side, you can create a social business to solve the problem of the people, otherwise you'll never get that. I said, what the economic system has put us, glasses, glasses with dollar sign, as I was explaining. I'm trying to put the glasses a little bit change. I said, I'm giving you bifocal glasses. You see the dollar sign, and also see the people sign. So you choose whichever you want. This, this is nothing about compulsion that you have to do it or not do it. If you feel that you have the capacity to do it, you can do that. This is the direction we can do. So now, with the young people are getting interested in the social business. We have um, more than 60 universities around the world who has social business centers in the universities, teaching social business to the young people, create social business ideas, and so on and so forth. I got, to, got into another problem in Bangladesh and led to another kind of direction. The, all the nine million borrowers, the women and the men that we have, are all illiterate. They cannot read, cannot write. At early stage, we decided we want to make sure that children do not repeat the history of their parents in literacy. So the children will become literate. So we make sure all the children of Grameen families go to school, have a good education. And we made it happen. And we give them scholarships, we give them education loans, because it's their bank. So we want to make sure that next generation all become literate and educated. So we have thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, graduates, school, high school graduates, college graduates, university graduates, doctors, engineers out of those illiterate families. Then problem began. They keep complaining, what good is this education because there's no job in Bangladesh. No job. Then I had to respond to that. How do we answer that question? One way I tried to answer that, and I continue to pursue that path, I asked them, why do you look for a job? Forget about job. Job is a very obsolete idea. It's an old-fashioned idea. Came from the wrong thinking from people. You tell yourself again and again, I'm not a job seeker, I'm a job creator. I'm an entrepreneur. And act like an entrepreneur, think like an entrepreneur, don't think like a job seeker. If you think like a job seeker, you feel small, you're at the mercy of other people. If you, talk, if you think like a job creator, an entrepreneur, you feel big. You feel tall, and that's how you're beginning with it. They keep saying, oh, we don't know how to start a business because our schools never taught us how to start a business. They taught us all kinds of things, nothing to do with business. I said, look at your mother. Your mother joined Grameen Bank 20 years back, 25 years back. And she stood up in her village to take a loan from Grameen Bank of $20, and she took that loan of $20 to start a business. So that's what her beginning was. She didn't say that I never, a school, never, I never been to school, they didn't teach me how to start a business. She responded as natural as it could be. I said, you know what is the dif difference between mother and you? Your mother is a natural human being. She acted in a very natural way. She didn't worry about whether school taught me or school didn't teach me. She thought this is an opportunity. If I had the money, I could sell that, I could produce that, I can make money and take care of myself. But you became an artificial human being because your school taught you how to get a job. Job is not a natural thing for human being. You, entrepreneurship is the, is the natural thing for human being. And when we were in the historical development on the planet, as we grew up in this planet, we are not looking for jobs. When we are in the caves, we are not sending job application to anybody. From cave number five to cave number ten, we just went ahead and did our thing. We became hunters, we became gatherers, 
as we progress, we become farmers. That's our history. Entrepreneurship is in our DNA. And that's what the creativity comes from. Creativity is about solving problems. And that's what we are. All, every human being is packed with unlimited creative capacity. Now, job cuts down that creative capacity because you are put in a slot. Slot doesn't allow you to use your creative capacity. It, job runs by instructions. It doesn't allow you to be yourself. So why should you give up your creativity for the sake of uh, making a living? Why don't you become an entrepreneur? So I tell them, why don't you go back to your mother and learn from her how to be a natural human being and come back with a business idea. Once you come with a business idea, like your mother did, here we are, we have a social business venture capital fund. We become an investor in your business. You run your business, we are the investor in your business. You make it successful, you return the money that we gave you. We are not interested in your profit because social business doesn't take any profit. We are very happy to get the money back to invest it to somebody else so that they can become an entrepreneur by themselves. That's the direction we have. Now that idea is spreading. Thousands and thousands of young people come with business ideas. We keep on investing in these businesses to become entrepreneurs. They didn't think that could be entrepreneurs. Suddenly they find out that they can good influence anybody else. Now this idea is being sought after by other countries because un unemployment is everywhere. Unemployment is in Europe, unemployment in Asia, Africa, Latin America, everywhere. I said, this is wrong thinking. The whole problem of unemployment is created by the concept of employment. If we didn't have the concept of employment, there is no concept of unemployment. How can a young person, creative, energetic, educated young person, sit there, do nothing, and say, I'm unemployed? It doesn't make sense. They have so many options, particularly these days in that time when all the technology is in their hand. With those technologies, they can do something fantastic, which never existed before. But they don't do it because I'm unemployed. They would rather march on the street, give me the job. I said, that's not the part. Here. So this is another direction that we keep reminding that human beings are entrepreneurs. This is the direction we want to take, and so on. And the other problem that worries me that I want to share quickly, as we are going through it, the problem of uh, environment. You are all familiar with environment issues. That's not what I'm going to say. It is the urgency of the situation, which look as if people don't are familiar with that. We have, if you want to keep the global temperatures to 1.5 Celsius, we have to get it done by 2040, which is about 20 years from now. So we have a window of 20 years to get things done. If you want to be a little bit relaxed, say, no, let's give some more time. It's a 2050, you have to bring it down to 1.5 degrees, or 2 degrees Celsius from 1.5 temperature. But you're gradually coming close to the point of no return. So you can't do anything. That urgency is completely missing. We've realized that there is a problem, but as if somebody will take care of it. So this is another direction that the world is heading for, a kind of a very small window of time. In 20 to 30 years, we have to get done the things that we have done for centuries, all the problems that we have done. The last one that worries me about the uh, technology, which you are very much involved, particularly one technology I will mention. I, I keep repeating that technology can be a curse technology can be a blessing. It depends on what we want to do with technology. If you're not careful, technology can easily go into curse direction. And I see that possibility in artificial intelligence. Although I hear about artificial intelligence, all I read about artificial intelligence, it will replace people. It will replace people in a massive way very soon. It's already started the process. We talk about the autonomous cars, autonomous trucks, and, and factories, autonomous factories. So it's not just a simply few people will be losing jobs, they will adjust themselves. It's a massive wave. 
What happens to those people who lose their job? Here we have a case of unemployed young people not having a job. On top of it, you're now talking, now you're adding the problem of people who had the job, now out of job. And people say, no, artificial intelligence is a fantastic thing. Because now we are coming to a stage of ultimate glory of human being. Machines should work, human beings should enjoy. And that's what we are coming to. I said, that's fine with me. But who is going to feed those people who are enjoying? Somebody has to feed them. And then they add, oh, we should be introducing universal basic income. Government should give them the money so that they can have the money to have the food on the table. I said, after all these years of human progress, do we come to a level where we become a world of beggars? That we live on other people's doors? That we cannot do anything? I said, I don't see that as something that I can accept. Human beings are supposed to be able to take care of themselves and take care of the rest of the world, each one of us. Now you're saying that we don't do anything, somebody is going to feed us? I don't want to be part of that society which creates an enormous group of people doing nothing and stay in somebody else's charity. So if that is the direction, I think this is a direction of curse. Artificial intelligence can be a wonderful blessing if we put it on the other side, solving the problem of healthcare problems, solving the problem of education, and many other things, putting in there. The moment you want to be greedy, you want to reduce the cost of production by putting machine, replacing human being, making your uh, bottom line bigger, you are on the path where we create this immediate crisis in the whole world. So these are the three issues that uh, worries me, that uh, which way to go. And ultimately, we have to redesign the things that we already have been doing. But just be, being focused on only one direction, maximization of profit or profit motive directed civilization that we have, we have to come back and rediscover ourselves as a human being. Not only we are selfish, also we are selfless. And we can do it as a business to solve all problems, all the problems in the world can be solved in a sustainable way, unlike doing it in a charity way. A charity is a wonderful thing that I'm not denying that, but charity has a limitation. Charity money goes out, does a great work, but money doesn't come back. So you have only one time use of your money. As the same thing, if you can design it as a business, a social business, money goes out, does the job, and comes back. Then you can use it again and again and again, infinitely. It becomes very powerful. That's the power of the social business. If you have that idea into your mind, you can go on, do that kind of thing. So that's the direction that we have. So these are the issues that I have been raising in this book that I just mentioned that published in World of Three Zeros, and saying that it can be done, but if you follow the old path, old roads that we all familiar, the kind of life that we live, we always end up with the old destination. Old destination of wealth concentration, old destination of joblessness, old destination of poverty, and other issues related to that. If you want to create a new destination where there is no poverty, there is no unemployment, there is no problem, threat to the world, then we have to build new roads. Old roads will not take us to the new destination. New destination needs new roads. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Professor Yunus. I appreciate you uh, sharing your incredible insights and valuable time with us today. Uh, I have just one question uh, relates really to your last point, and then if we could get a couple of questions from the audience. As far as, as technology goes, a lot of the people here are working on projects, uh, very technology-focused, uh, smart contracts, trying to automate things. 
Uh, how important has community and the human element been in the success of Grameen Bank? Do you feel that that success could have been automated? Well, one is to success to be automated. And another thing is to bring technology to be success. These are two different things. Already success is done. You simply simplifying it, easing it. That's also good. But you can make fundamental things. You can change the whole world differently if you put your mind in solving those problems. That's the power of technology. Today, te the drivers of technology, I would say in Broadway, there are two drivers of technology. One is the money makers. They want to make money by using technology, designing technology. And then there's war makers. They want to fight wars, make it more sophisticated, kill more smoothly, cheaply, etc., etc., more devastatingly. So these are the two drivers. The social driver is missing. So that's what I'm going to say. Those people who are doing it for money making, they can also be social driver. Same person. I'm not talking about a different group of person. I'm saying you have that power, but you're not using it. Use that power, suddenly you see the world will be different because you use your mind in creating a technology to solve all the problems that you have listed on your, in front of you. Each one of them is solvable. Simply, you, we are not paying attention because we have the dollar glass in our eyes. That's all. Thank you. I think that's a, a call to action certainly for this group and hopefully this movement of uh, blockchain and uh, alternative currencies may make a difference. Uh, time for two questions. Uh, you've got your hand up here. Hi, my name Hello. is Nicolette Rankin, and uh, I've been studying your work for the last 10 years. I started the first microfinance program for World Vision International because of your work, so thank you for that. My question it revolves around credit delivery systems. I don't believe, I agree with you on universal um, income is not going to generate the most value for the world. Um, what is your thought on income share pricing or income share value-based economies? There's a lot moving in the education space today. Somehow I can't understand the question part. Uh, so, um, in education financing, there's a form of a financial structure called an income share agreement. And the income share agreement allows someone to pay for a percentage of, pay for tuition with a percentage of their income for a set amount of time. So it's a, it's a new credit product. Have you done any work around income share agreements with education, are you, could you talk a little bit about income sharing or income-based economies, uh, Any, anything in that realm? All, all are possible, this is nothing impossible. It's a question of the purpose. Why do you share the income? Is it to make money for yourself or solving problems with the others? That's it. Everything is okay. Simply I'm saying that the purpose can be different. Technology is okay, what is the purpose? Education is okay, what is the purpose? To create a new form of credit. Absolutely, so that's the direction. Like, uh, we create a lot of educational institutions as a social business. No intention of making money, but a sustainable thing so that people get their education in the right pr proper way and so on. Health education, nursing colleges, medical colleges, hospitals, we do that as a social business. So that is self-sustaining. It's not dependent on charity, we are not going Fundraising every year, that's one thing is finished. We don't do fundraising. We generate funds ourselves. As a business, we generate funds. So it becomes independent, it can, you can plan things. When you raise funds every year, you cannot plan things. You don't know how much money you'll get. Everybody remains nervous. Can we continue the same size, same people next year? Because of the money coming in. So you spend more time in raising money than doing the work. So this is the problem. So instead of the charity per way, we try to translate it into the social business way. That's the only thing we've done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> fascinating talk. I'm Howard Marks. My question is, how did you work with the regulators, especially in Bangladesh? Uh, because I have to imagine there's corruption, 
there was a lot of red tape, a lot of heaviness, and you were coming with some br bright new ideas that are simple, simple to explain, and yet you're faced with these government and these local government and the corruption and the power struggles. How did you overcome that? Well, the bureaucracy is difficult because uh, their job is to go and scrutinize and remind you that you cannot do this, you cannot do that. We have problems both ways. We have problems in Bangladesh with these regulators and uh, people who are involved in it. Also in the USA. For the USA, for example, uh, your uh, American welfare law. In many states, welfare law is built in such a way, if you earn a dollar during the month, you have to report it to the welfare authority. And welfare authority will deduct it from your dollar. So the question is that what is the fun of earning the dollar if you deduct it? So there is no incentive in doing that. Not only this incentive, there is an extreme disincentive in earning any money. So you sit there and wait for the dollar. Check. I said, if I was designing that regulation or this little rule, I would have designed it completely differently. I said, yes, if you earn a dollar, you have to report to the welfare authority. And welfare authority's responsibility is to match you with another dollar. Because you earn one dollar. So that you are so that you are, you feel incentive in earning more money, so that you get out of welfare. As if welfare is designed to keep you in welfare. They don't want you to get out of welfare. So these are the kind of mismatch in thinking process. Same thing. In Bangladesh, we ran into problem with microcredit. They want to regulate it through the central bank. The central bank is our regulator in Bangladesh. A banking regulator is the central bank. I said, that's very funny. Because the regulator doesn't know anything about microcredit. They only know the conventional banking. So they will bank, bring the conventional banking regulation experiences, rules to apply here. Here I'm saying it's a completely opposite thing. I try to explain to them, I said, it's like football. I said, there's a European football, there's an American football. Now you are hiring coaches from American football to guide the European football. I said, it will be a disaster. Because he doesn't know anything about the European football. So the same thing happens. So I said, our job is to create a separate regulatory authority for microgram. After years of this lobby, finally government agreed created an independent regulatory authority for microcredit, who understand what we do, how we do, why we do, etc., etc. So that's very clear. So the laws become a problem. How to negotiate with each other because they don't understand each other. That understanding is very important. We are not saying all the microcredit is safe, they do the right job. No. But somebody has to know what is right, what is wrong. And then you can apply the law. Thank you. Thank you. Questions. Thank you again. Thank you. Anybody else who has questions, uh, Professor Yunus is going to be around for uh, another half an hour to an hour on the floor. So uh, hopefully you may be able to engage in there. Thank, Thank you again. You. Thank you very much.